can't touch this. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. You can't touch this. My, 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 my music hit me so hard. Makes me say, oh my Lord, thank you. All right. How about that? Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Jason Carrion from uh, Quartz. I'm our uh, London bureau chief there. I'm joined by uh, Christo and Jan uh, here. For, for We're going to have a little chat about, about what customers want from fintech. Uh, Christo, who you, you, a lot of you probably already know from TransferWise, um, co-founded the International Transfers Group in 2011, now doing uh, around 700 million um, transferred every month dollars. Um, 35 currencies via 500 different routes. But again, I, we're not going to go too, too long into the int, int, intros. You probably all know Crystal. You probably all know TransferWise. You probably use it. If you don't use it, you might be competing with them. Um, Jan Hammer from uh, Index Ventures, uh, you joined the uh, VC fund in 2010, involved pretty heavily in fintech. Um, and uh, we should mention that Trans, TransferWise is an investment of yours, a very early one. Maybe we can get into some of that uh, later. Um, and so if you out there don't know who Jan is, and you, and you happen to run a fintech company, you definitely should. You're uh, missing out there. So what we want to talk about today is what customers want from fintech. Um, I think the risk sometimes at, at very good conferences like this is that there's a bit of preaching to the converted. Uh, can be a bit self-referential, a bit inward looking. Um, so let's not lose sight of what, of what customers actually want and what customers expect from technology <coughs> companies operating in the financial services industry. A lot of people might not be happy with their banks, a lot of us aren't, but that still doesn't mean that it's easy to make them switch, I'm sure, as, as, as we can all know. Um, a recent TransferWise survey that, that you, you guys did found that two-thirds of people have never used a tech firm to deliver any kind of financial services. Um, obviously, adoption is growing fast. That's why we're all here on this very uh, whizzy uh, stage. Um, but we need to sort of get back to first principles, I think. And so, Crystal, maybe first, just from you, it's not always about just faster and cheaper. I mean, what, when, you, when you go back to first principles and think about what <coughs> consumers want from fintech, what, what kind of guides you there? A lot of that, Jason, is actually faster, cheaper. I mean, take it or leave it. But I think, uh, as, as you said, people in the audience who try to compete with banks, you know, they've, they've noticed that the way that the world works is your, your, paycheck, your paycheck arrives at a bank account and then for the rest of your life you're going to buy services from that bank that relate to money. So that's just, uh, it's not their fault, that's just how life is. Your, your money's there, you buy a pension from there, you do your international payments, your merchant account, all is going to be, all is going to be there. Um, and I think only now we're starting to see that change. So, so the, uh, uh, the, the survey, so we were also kind of wondering that you know, is it, is it this bubble that we're, we're all in? Like, we all believe that uh, the world's going to change, that you know, technology is going to innovate banking. But uh, then we went out and asked around 10,000 people, like, what do, they, what do they think about this? And uh, surprisingly, about 80% said that in 10 years' time, so it's still a long time, in 10 years' time, they believe that uh, a tech company will do a lot of their kind of money affairs. So you start to think about it. Yes, we're probably a bit in the bubble here, but uh, it's not just us. I think people outside are seeing it as well, that the tech companies are now able to do things that banks do and just better. So faster, cheaper, as you say, but also, also more conveniently, more transparently. So I think you know, we are a bit in the bubble, but, uh, uh, but everyone's smelling a change. It's just going to be a, a few, few more years away. Yeah, yeah. Jan, do you have anything to add to that? I mean, you get a lot of pitches. You see a lot of companies, a lot of different business, business models. What, what, what sort of problem are they trying to solve, or, or, or do they not come to you with that you would prefer to see when it comes to talking about customers? Yeah, thanks for setting the stage, uh, Jason. <laughs> I, I think we here in the room, uh, whether investors or founders or uh, participants in uh, sort of investing in these uh, exciting startups can get carried away with the jargon that this industry has invented, whether it's the fin or the tech part of fintech. Mm -hmm. And I think we, it's so easy to lose sight of the, of the customer. And ultimately, I would point to sort of the seismic shifts that have 
happen in the recent years, and you know they are just so simple from uh, daily life. It's you know on savings, um, for the first time really ever, consumers have faced zero interest. So you put your money in the bank and you get zero. Uh, that's new. Um, and similar sort of shock experience has, has come on the borrowing side. It's not that uh, borrowing has become dearer. It's just you know a lot of people have been denied credit. Banks have not been lending. And, and I think th these were sort of the, the shifts that, that have created the room in the market. And then you sort of ask, so wh what do these startups uh, need to show? What, what do they need to demonstrate to the audience to sort of overcome these sort of really simple daily problems? I want to save. I want to borrow. I want to send money abroad. I want to, I'm in Britain, and I want to pay in euros. And I would point to two factors. One is trust, mm -hmm. and the other is transparency. Trust has been eroded in this industry through sort of the crisis. And transparency, for the first time, again, regulator-driven, um, internet driven, mobile driven, um, you know, information travels faster. The consumer has woken up and suddenly has seen that to withdraw 100 euros from your sterling bank account when you go to France, uh, there's a five pound minimum and three pound uh, fee, and the spread has got a markup of 5%, which <laughs> David and Christo have, have um, um, really played into um, and have given consumers a product that is simple, cheaper, faster. And sure. convenient. But I think, like Jan, the reason why you know, I, remember, uh, I remember pitching to you in 2011, <laughs> right? <laughs> or you and, your, you and your friends, and uh, you were the only ones who eventually invested in TransferWise in like early 2012. Um, but I think, if I'm not mistaken, the, the thing that excited you wasn't necessarily just the concept, but you saw this working. You saw people, you spoke to people who actually used it. And, and they enjoyed it. So when we look at why TransferWise has worked, it's not just that we believe we built a better product, but when you have like 60% of our user base has only joined TransferWise because their friend has told them, then this is the, the kind of the power of masses that is going to make that change work. So we believe that innovation is going to take hold, but until you have that power of masses or until you build a product that kind of engages the, those masses, until then, it's just uh, in our bubble. Yeah, yeah. and I, 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 would, I would echo that by saying that what we loved was that you built the product that you wanted to use yourself. It's kind of built, built by you for you. Um, and and we, we've seen some fantastic examples of, of this. One of them would be in our portfolio, a company called Robinhood uh, that has come up with uh, zero commission brokerage. Again, a product built by millennials for millennials something that they wanted to use themselves, but they didn't see in the market. So they built a beautiful product to use themselves. Yeah. So if I can push back a little bit on that, though, the, 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 the survey that, that you guys did, too, the, in the ranking of what, of what people wanted from uh, tech companies in terms of financial services, number one, by some distance, was that it's more secure, that it's safer. And then below that, cost, convenience, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so how? You know, and famously, people get divorced more frequently than they change their bank accounts and all those, those kinds of stats that, that we'll all know. I mean, how did you, Christo, this, this is kind of an interesting case study, how did you build up trust from the beginning? How do you convince people to part with their money to use you, you know, to, to use this, 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 this new app to do something that they did with their banks before? How does that, how does that work? That is a very good question. Yeah. So I can honestly tell you, before the day before we launched in 2011, I didn't really believe that we will. You know, thought it's worth a try, mm. but I really, honestly, didn't uh, didn't believe that people are going to tr trust it. And it was only by putting it out there and seeing that 15 minutes later, you know, someone puts 2,000 pounds on our account to send it to France, and then you know, euros start arriving. Then you then you suddenly realize that actually, you know, if it's a well executed product, it, it looks real, it's licensed and regulated by the government, and it all makes sense, then people are now incredibly more trusting with tech companies because they see that you know, <clears throat> Google hasn't really massively cocked up anything. Like more often we hear banks cocking up than, 
than big uh, mm -hmm. tech companies. We see, you know, WhatsApp putting on um, privacy on their things. You know, Apple not budging to to governments. You know, it's, they see that the, the the tech companies are taking the side of the consumer, and they're not cocking up as much as banks are. So that kind of initial sign showed me that trust is possible. It is possible to trust something new, something well executed. And, uh, and, and since then, the way that Transwise works is, is those guys who've trusted it first, you know, build up that, that trust uh, as they go along by telling their friends. And then the friends use it and it works. And they <coughs> tell their friends and yeah. it still works. And suddenly, like five years later, when you're in a place where you haven't cooked up once, and the thing works, so it becomes like a, a meme that transfers works. Right. And, and, and I think what's, what's important, and what I would like to, uh, what, what we think, and we, we're quite a proud of ourselves, is that we have actually proven for the, for the wider industry that this is possible to, to generate trust. And we've proved to the public audience as well that you can trust those tech companies. So we feel like almost double responsible that we shouldn't really cock up because yeah. otherwise we we'll just not lose trust in TransferWise, but also you lose trust in the whole movement. Yeah. And, that, and, and that's interesting too because uh, from there, sort of what you were suggesting and we were talking about earlier too was, was that there is a group of early adopters who try everything and often I find in the, in the, in the, in the tech world and especially around <coughs> mo mobile apps or whatever, there's the they don't grow beyond that early adopter stage. But you're su su suggesting from day one you can get that enthusiastic user base and then through word of mouth and you know you obviously do a lot of marketing too, that you can build up quite quickly trust that, that for banks and traditional financial services companies have, have spent you know, decades, centuries. Yeah, I think, I mean, Jan will agree with me when you, when you say early adopters is just very, you just have to be careful why the early adopters are using it. Is it just because they're curious? And they just try out, want to try out the new technology, but it, does it act, or, or does it actually solve the problem? So when we say early adopters, we mean people are more willing to switch, but they actually get benefit, and they, they see that it's solving their problem. Yeah. I think we also have, sometimes we talk about early adopters as just people who are curious and want to try out a new app, and that's not necessarily sustainable. Yeah. How, does, how, how, do, you, how do you think about this from your, from your perspective of seeing the early user base and building that security and safety and trust yeah. in something that people hadn't heard of, you know, yes, yesterday. Yeah, it's a, it's a very good point. I, I, th I think, uh, while I agree with everything, I would also add, you know, banks haven't gone away. They've taken decades to build trust. Trust has been eroded in, in, in many places, but um, they have also built, um, you know, large, um, you know, compliance operations, um, um, settlement and, um, uh, you know, payment networks, and you know th those have taken long to build. So I, I would say um, the many startups that that we see, the, the sort of the first wave, have sort of reaped the, the the low hanging fruit, and have sort of in many cases offered a sort of a a, a very slick front end, have uh, brought in early adopters into the funnel. But I think the hard work, you know, the next wave of work is is really building that sort of full st full stack of infrastructure kind of doing uh, more and deeper for, for the mass market that, you know, that one thing that they do really well. And, and that can include examples like not taking you off, you know, the app into an environment which is then not their environment mm -hmm. where the consumer is being passed on to, you know, it could be a, 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 a bank partner website. But I, I, I think there are legitimate routes to getting those, those masses onto your service. And in many cases, um, the new fintech startups have partnered with banks, and we have, you know, examples in in, in our portfolio as well. Whether that's Funding Circle or uh, or others, or in fact, uh, Transferwise uh, uh, have got a, now a banking partnership. So, I think it takes time to build the full stack and kind of get everybody onto the service. It's a journey, and it will it will in many cases um, take a lot of capital, and um, um, and I think it's it's really a great opportunity for the newcomers to kind of decide, do I play sort of horizontally across just the front end across many services, or am I just going to do one thing extremely well and build that full service and kind of ignore all the other possibilities? Because, yeah, I would, yeah. you know, to be honest with you, there, there are a lot of companies that come to us and they all have the same business plan. You know, some may come from lending, some may come from 
savings. Some may come from brokerage or other places, but then they will all uh, claim that they will do everything for all consumers. And I sort of, uh, in a way, cannot believe that because kind of the sum total adds up to you know, hundreds of percent of market share, and it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. do, do you, as an investor, do you have any bias or preference? It, it sounds to me like, like, like you're looking for maybe a bit more focus these days and, and, and acknowledgement of where core competence, let's say, to use yeah. management speak. Is that, yeah. is that fair? We definitely do look for focus, uh, but it, again, starts back with, with the product, having an exceptionally good product where um, you get your first customers fanatical about it and doing that one thing extremely well and then building the, the full stack, if you will, mm -hmm. controlling the journey from the beginning of the customer coming in all the way to the end and delivering a service that's flawless, that's seamless, that's uh, transparent, uh, that delivers value. Right. Uh, I think that's, that's definitely a, a route to a great but, business plan. But also perhaps not, not being too precious about, about having to own the whole end to end everything, that, that, that it's sophisticated to acknowledge that you can't do everything. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, what we're also seeing is that there are people who are now starting to specialize in bits of the journey, uh -huh. and um, that may be, you know, providing the plumbing or infrastructure, and then sort of offering it across the, the spectrum. We're also seeing great partnerships between sort of the new and the new. Mm -hmm. um, and again, uh, you know, examples like um, you know, Robinhood partnering with StockTwits or NerdWallet or Quantopian um, to create uh, mass distribution. So again, people pick their competences and those who, who do that well will, will succeed. Yeah. Christo, let's talk about the new partnering with the old because fairly recently TransferWise has done some partnerships with banks in Estonia and Germany. Why not? Why now? Tell me about this, this sort of journey of partnering with banks now, because you know, a lot of what you hear amongst fintech companies are banks are bad, we're, we're mm -hmm. disrupting banks, we're replacing them. And that's probably a lot of what the messaging that I remember early, early transfer-wise being. But now you have gotten into bed with them, so to speak. Well, how did that come about, and how does, how does it work? <laughs> Getting to bed with people <laughs> is always good. Um, <laughs> the, I was actually listening to, to Jan speak about the, uh, you know, whether you should go deep like infrastructure-wise, or you should, uh, you know, try and reuse as much as possible, and 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 try to package it better, basically, as in as in a better front-end, better UX, better customer service. I was trying to think back to our experience, like how would I, how would I relate to that? And you know what's fascinating is that in our journey, it was almost impossible to do them separately. We had to do a bit of a good, great front-end and customer service to actually get the consumers on, and then at the same time kind of going very deep because you can't really build a good product if you don't go deep. So the, the speed and the convenience mm -hmm. and even the trust that you get actually means that you need to you know, replace quite a lot of what banks are, are built on. So we've kind of taken the hard way in some sense, some sense trying to do both at once. But I think what's interesting in, your, in what you're saying is that now, um, now that there's new and new partnerships, you can actually only focus on the kind of the, the deep uh, infrastructure because you you won't be able to sell to banks. I think today uh, many in the audience are trying to sell to banks. You know that's that's not a kind of startup yeah. life. It's, it's very very hard. But but you can sell to new startups or other startups. So I think when you now, now that might be possible that you can actually only work on infrastructure. Don't worry about the kind of the old banks and just sell to the sell to the new ones and that that should actually speed up the, the whole innovation in the industry quite a bit. So that's very interesting. But unfortunately, as Jason said, we had a totally kind of different, uh, different story. So uh, we, went, we went in a way that we became independent first. So we almost today have built up a, a parallel infrastructure to correspondent banking so we can deliver money to 98% of the, the world's bank accounts Without, without a swift message, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So this is, in some sense, quite, quite fascinating that you know, there's all these banks working, working in a, a kind of the old way of, of correspondent banking, and then there's TransferWise with a parallel reality. And now what you talked about is this is starting to converge a little bit. We have those two banks who decided that rather than uh, you know, earning a bit of money, giving our customers a poor service, um, giving them the old like, 
international payments that where you don't know where your money is, uh, you have to charge fees, the recipient gets charged fees, etc. Why don't we just let our customers link the, their banking app with a TransferWise app? So you link those two apps, um, you're still in the banking experience, you're still in your internet bank, but now you're making an international payment and it's going through TransferWise. Not as a white label, but it's, it's just a different service being used within the, within the skin of the, the bank app. I think there's a huge difference whether you're a white label or, or a real, real partnership. So in order to avoid this kind of master-slave, uh, master-servant relationship with, uh, with a bank, you, I think startups today still need to become independent first before you can start striking those relationships. So though actually with those banks we've been uh, speaking for years, but it's, it was only now the right moment to, that we're independent enough, we have a, a, a big uh, like mass following, a good product that actually we can build a side-to-side side side product. D d does that not require any compromise on your on your part to 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 bring on these new partners to do it diff differently with the you know old style banks who we were trying to disrupt? No, so I don't think we we need to compromise. If you think our mission is that we're we're solving the the problem of the public paying about 200 billion dollars to the to the banks for for moving money internationally, what the what what we used to say is it's only TransferWise and, um, and Bank of England where you get the real exchange rate. Now it's TransferWise, Bank of England, and those two banks. So we've kind of moved on the revolution that there are now two banks in the world where you can get a mid-market exchange rate and transparent fees. So this is, this is a big step. It's a small step. There's, there's not a huge, <coughs> a huge number of customers who use those banks, but there, are, there, there is a case that two banks in the world are offering mm -hmm. mid-market rate transparent fees. It helps our customers and it helps their customers because, you know, the, the bank in Germany can now, the, the customer of the bank in Germany, um, it will take 17 seconds to move money uh, to a UK bank account or, mm -hmm. you know, wherever. So the, the speed that they get, the convenience that they get uh, is very useful for the bank customers and for us, helps us move on the, the mission. Yeah, so just for reference, this is LHV in Estonia, number 26 in Germany. Can we expect more banking partnerships from TransferWise in the future? Are, are, they, are, they, are they pounding down your uh, doors and Yeah, so look, looking, looking at the interest, then, then definitely there, there will be more. Um, it's, not, it's not part of our strategy. I think we can actually su succeed uh, with, without it, but I think it's very natural, and it helps our helps their customers, it helps our customers. It's actually more convenient. Yeah. So we, we love it to, right. we love it to love. Yeah. Jan, we, he was mentioning, you know, to start out independent, proof of concept, standing on your own, and then sort of partnering with the, the old school, however you want to see. Is that, does, does that resonate with you too as a, as a wise strategy for startups? Or could there also be a model where from the beginning, we were talking about trust and safety and all this kind of before, wouldn't it help to have those kind of name brands with you to begin with, or? Yeah, I, I think what, the way I would answer the question is uh, you don't escape from having that amazing killer product. I think you then move to how do you distribute it. Yes. And um, uh, a lot of companies out there have figured out new ways, and we continue to look for new ways how to kind of get that product out. Um, I think... Um, the independent route has definitely, in the early days, worked for all innovators, whether that's Robin Hood, who came up with the concept of um, uh, a pre-registration and a queue in the App Store, or whether that's uh, companies like Revolut, who have spent no money on marketing and have not sort of partnered uh, uh, to sort of be a, an app for a banking partner. They are an app in itself, uh, essentially delivering instant uh, bank in an app. Um, and uh, the way that works is, is you send, you know, me sending you 10 pounds, I can send you $10 or whatever other currency, I can send it to you instantly by you receiving, you essentially opening a wallet and mm -hmm. you kind of get viral distribution through that mechanism. Um, so I, I would again point at uh, sort of innovation in 
getting the product out is, is what really drives that, that early success. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, speaking of inno innovation, we, we have a few minutes left. Let's talk about the future of this. Let's, let's go off piece, blue oceans, all this kind of stuff. Um, what, uh, I know we, we were talking a little bit about insurance, and you're pretty excited about insurance in terms of, of the scope for um, fintech being a bit bigger there than in perhaps some other areas. Just want to tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, Insur insurance we, we're really excited about. And the reason for that is, is back to that very first principle of uh, transparency. Um, it's an industry where not only transparency has been lacking, but it's also one where it is frankly difficult to achieve because you have asymmetric information on risk. Uh, you know, if you're insuring, you, you, you may possibly know the level of your risk, but you may not know, and the other side certainly is only making an estimate of how risky you are uh, to insure. So um, with sort of more data being out there, uh, we're scratching our heads and looking for entrepreneurs to you know, come up with you know, better uses of data to overcome asymmetry of information. Um, and in specific here, applied to insurance, but we're looking at sort of data and information service uh, type business models in general. You know, we invested in a company called Credit Benchmark, mm -hmm. which contributes data um, that's a sort of a byproduct of banks' activities uh, to create uh, transparency in uh, credit risk pricing, which again has been lacking because of the conflict of interest that sort of surrounds the rating agency business model where the issuer of a security pays for the rating not the person who's bearing the risk of owning the security. Um, and that contributed data model is applicable to many other markets, not, not just credit. It, it can be applied to insurance. Um, and, and where we feel there's a, a sort of a fundamental big opportunity is because it can sort of re rewrite the way markets operate on a far more democratic level with everybody having access to information that's mm. sort of shared across all participants. Yeah. Uh, great. Um, Christo, a question for you. I, we, you know, there's obviously the TransferWise site, and it's now in bank apps, too. Would we perhaps see TransferWise in the future in, like, WhatsApp and messaging, this kind of thing? You know, there's, 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 there's a lot of people who have smartphones now, and there's a lot of places where they, they spend their time in social media and in their messaging programs. I mean, are, are you looking to push TransferWise into other places? That's a very good question. So. I think there's a theme going on. Is, is messaging the new e ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Like, is the new is messaging yeah. a new operating system so you can do everything from yep. messaging? Well, and then absolutely, yes, you, you should be able to do all your banking stuff from messaging, including transferwise. Where, uh, and that's something that we're we're looking at as well. So the question is, uh, the, the difficulty in this is that a lot of the financial infrastructure is miles away from uh, from messaging, so you can't really access your money. Yeah. from that kind of messaging, messaging app yet. But it's a very interesting kind of thought process because I think that that theme that a lot of the stuff is going into messaging is there. So there's nothing that we can really, really fight about. What's, you know, what's fascinating about the future is what I, what I think about often is like all of you in the, in the room are, are looking at the, the most profitable parts of the, the universal banking that, uh, that you looking to do better or disrupt or, 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 or bite away. And I'm wondering sometimes, because banks work on like cross-subsidizing mm -hmm. basis, so they have profitable products that subsidize lesser profitable ones. Like what happens once uh, this starts kind of crumbling together? So that once we're done with uh, like more profitable ones, like does it mean that the banks will really, really fast uh, need to change their entire kind of pricing and, uh, and, and business model. And sometimes I'm scared, like what the, what the world would look like and whether the governments are going to do stupid things then. Sorry. Yeah, I, I think it's a really <laughs> interesting vision. And, and I think it, you push it further. And I think that's where uh, payments, which we believe is not an area that's done on the consumer side, messaging, kind of where you know, the banking sector is heading. I think when you really push the future sort of far out, I, I don't think it's inconceivable to, to sort of, you know, paint a picture where money is not held in banking institutions in the future. Um, I think that that's kind of 
probably the world where we might be living in, in a decade. Yeah. So just to wrap up, I wanted, I wanted to get some advice, perhaps, for everyone here from both of you, um, from, from, from your different per perspectives. Jan, what, if there was one or two things that you, that you want to see in the pitches that are coming to you, perhaps from people in this, in this room, what would they be? What, what, what are you particularly look, looking for now? Let's, let's get to the, to the meat uh, matter here. Sure. Uh, the, the, the one thing we always look for is you know, a very simple product idea that solves a real problem. You know, it saves time, saves money, it's intuitive, it just does what it says. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Christo, you've, uh, you're obviously always on the lookout for uh, funding. Anyone want to help you out? We just, our, the previous panel had a number of different types of investors. I know you've been talking to a number of different types, too. How about from that perspective? What, what, what do you, if there's people who want to get in on TransferWise now, they're probably a bit late, but still, like, what, what, what's, what are you thinking there in terms of, I know even there's sovereign wealth funds I've seen that perhaps have been, have been coming to you, regular VCs, corporate VCs, banks, et cetera. What's, what's going on there from your perspective? So, I would very much welcome people who want to get in on TransferWise. We're hiring all the time. <laughs> that too. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, um, thank you very, very much, you, you two. And, and please, can we thank Christo and Jan for providing some insights for us. Thanks a lot.